Hi everyone, sorry for that delay. My name's Anne McKenna. I'm a publisher at Oxford University Press here in Melbourne. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar on understanding the new study design for VCE Legal Studies. And thanks for tuning in at the end of your busy day. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands on which we create and share our learning resources. We acknowledge the traditional owners as the original storytellers, teachers and students of the land we call Australia. We pay our respects to elders past and present, and we also extend that respect to all Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us here today. So the core of today's session will be taking you through key changes to the study design and how we've approached them in our new editions, and also how to teach First Nations perspectives respectfully. Then I will introduce you to our new edition and we'll have some time for questions at the end. I'm happy to have all three of our amazing authors here today, Lisa Philippen, Annie Wilson and Peter Farrar. They are all experts in VCE legal studies and Lisa will tell you a bit about how they work in a minute. And we're all very pleased to have Emily Yates here today. Emily is a Bundjalung woman and is a managing lawyer at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service or VALS. Emily reviewed the First Nations content of our new editions to ensure that our approach to that content was both accurate and respectful. We've produced a guide for teachers to the new study design with an overview of changes, including what's in, what's out, and what's been moved around. After the webinar today, you'll receive logins to digital samples of both the student books as well as a guide, this guide to the study design. And after the webinar, we'll share the recording so that you don't need to spend time copying information off the slides. So now I'm going to hand over to Lisa. Thanks very much, Anne, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. Before we move on to having a look at some of the ways in which the textbooks address the key changes, I thought it would be worth giving a bit of an overview as to how we approach the new editions and in particular how we work as an author team. First, as mentioned by Anne and Annie, Peter and myself make up the author team. We've been working together for a few years now and this being our third edition together. And the way we approach it is that we take ownership of particular chapters, but we ensure that each chapter is reviewed by at least one other author for accuracy and consistency. As lead author, I take on the role of reviewing all the chapters and collaborating closely with Anne and the team about the features of each of the books. And having one person review them means that we can not only ensure that there's consistency in terms of features and language, but that connections can be made throughout the books. You will notice re references back to different chapters and to ensure that you and the students can make those connections with units, particularly in units three and four. From a structure perspective in terms of uh, the books, the biggest changes you will see are in unit one because of the substantial moving around, but really sort of a lot of the structure remains the same. We've kept certain chapters, for example, the chapters on summary and law and other areas of civil law. The books closely follow the study design as per the current editions, including following the structure of the key knowledge, but we've carefully combined key knowledge where it's sensible to do so. So for example, the VLRC topic, for example, we combine the information about the VLRC and the recent examples of the VLRC, which Annie will talk to in a second. In terms of, I just thought I'd briefly just talk about the changes within the text. Um, we took really a two pronged approach. First, we avoided changing things that we didn't think needed to be changed. So basically, we didn't throw out explanations or cases that really we know work very well. We're particularly conscious that there's already a lot to get across in terms of the more substantive changes. So we didn't want to feel like you were learning new ex explanations or cases where there wasn't really a need to. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of those landmark cases that we've kept in the books. At the same time, as however, we, we saw it as a blank canvas opportunity. So, as you know, three years is a long time in the legal system. So, we've checked to make sure that things remain current. You know, little things like, for example, adding in the new requirement in a defamation case for there to be established serious harm. So, we sort of carefully checked over and made sure that there are any updates or changes that need to be made from a legal perspective. And we have added in more features where we thought it was sensible to do so. So, for example, there are some really good new tables in sanctions and remedies, adding in some of the factors that students can consider when determining whether they achieve their purposes. 
and comparison tables, for example, in Unit 3, Area Study 2, there's now a requirement for the students to compare the roles of key personnel across criminal and civil. So we brought in some similarities and, and differences tables there. I thought I'd briefly mention, just, uh, just briefly touch on the cases. As I mentioned, in relation to the cases, we've kept many of the older um, landmark cases. So you'll still see Tasmanian Dam case, Studded Belt case, Brisland case, the Kevin and Jennifer case, for example, where we didn't really feel like there was any need to add in new ones where those ones are really tried and true and still work really well, even in 2024. At the same time, though, we've taken the opportunity to refresh some of the cases, particularly in the criminal and civil law area and in relation to the law reform petitions and demonstrations examples. So, for example, you'll see some contemporary examples like the push to change the law in relation to the banning of Nazi symbols, the 2020, 2020 Court of Appeal case in Brown involving disapproving and overruling a precedent, data security breaches and the need for law reform in that area recent examples of crossbench pressure in relation to climate change and changes to gas prices. Artists know, formerly known as Kanye West trying to seek an injunction in the federal court. So we sort of brought in a lot of those new contemporary cases where we felt like they would work. And a lot of time is spent choosing the right case. So it's not necessarily a 2023 case when we feel like there might be an older case, whether it be from a few years ago or from a long time ago. So, for example, the role of, of the prosecutor in relation to um, the role of limiting their closing address to the evidence and not, um, you know, sort of generating emotions from jury members. We found a 2004 case where, you know, the prosecutor was sort of almost trying to reverse the, was seen to be reversing the burden of proof um, in their closing address. And so we've brought something like that a really good example in. We've also given a lot of thought as to what examples can be used for new things like the international pressure stop point. So we interpreted that as being what sort of external inter international forces can be applied on parliament to make or not make law. And we've used two particular examples in that one. One, climate change, because there's just a really lot of really good relevant information there and lots of internal pressures from activists, from countries, from the United Nations to be able to sort of really sort of give life to that particular dot point. And we've also used the age of criminal responsibility as another example of that international pressure that's been applied um, on Australia to seek to change the law and use different examples of the types of pressures that can be applied. In terms of the choice of the Australian jurisdiction in Unit Two, um, we don't we don't talk about this in the in the next few slides, but there is now a requirement to look at an Australian jurisdiction in terms of the sentencing practices in Unit Two, and we've chosen the Northern Territory as we found this one gave the students the greatest ability to consider things like different court systems and current issues such as overcrowding of prisons and overrepresentation of First Nations people in the prisons. And finally, just before I move on to Peter, I thought that one the, the one thing to mention is that um, one thing you'll notice is some of the cases have been anonymised, particularly recent ones involving civil disputes or offenders. We, we, the decision was made for sensitivity reasons and to some not reduce the risk of students identifying with the case. The citations are still in there, so you can go back to the case to get more, more information. And we've done it on a case-by-case -case basis. We haven't obviously anonymised really high profile or landmark cases where there was really no point to do so. I will now pass on over to Peter, who I think will talk through changes in relation to um, difficulties faced by people in the criminal justice system. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, welcome to everyone. This is um, a new part of Unit 1 area of Study 3. It really mirrors aspects of the factors in um, Unit 3, and it's quite an interesting part of the course. Um, notice it's got... Um, the main groups, there's, there's, five, it's got the words uh, such as. So where it says uh, such as, it means you're not obviously limited to these. You can go outside of these. But the main ones which we've uh, looked at here is um, First Nations people, young people, culturally and uh, linguistically diverse people, people with mental health issues, and people with a disability. Um, what we've done, you'll notice, we've actually conflated disability with mental health. However, we need to point out that the level of mental health condition would be severe to be considered a disability. So it doesn't cover, um, you know, regular conditions which where people are able to manage themselves um, and it's not to the extent where it's considered to be a disability as such. But given the way that the criminal justice system works and, look, if we look at all the, um, look at the judgments that we might have read with our students, certainly in Unit 2, um, looking at uh, sanctions, 
Uh, the issues to do with mental health tend tend to come up quite often. So I think this part of the course is quite valuable for students because what it does, it sort of formalises those factors around sentencing and um, and criminal behaviour, which we've always known uh, through reading of uh, cases, but we, ne we, we can now formally actually um, uh, uh, study this part of the course. Just in terms of the key knowledge, <clears throat> um, as, as is uh, noted there on the screen, um, schools aren't bound to the five which are here and uh, which are in the book, um, knowing we've actually conflated mental health with, uh, with um, a disability uh, dot point. However, we would, we've actually written the book with um, really being mindful of you know, cases which really flesh out the difficulties and actually what they are. Even the word difficulty in itself demands an analysis. It's really difficulty in doing what? Difficulty in even knowing that a crime has actually been committed against a person, difficulty in dealing with police, difficulty in dealing with the legal system, but also difficulty in being willing to, in some cases, go against what might be that person's um, her cultural mores to come forward and actually complain about an issue which might have happened to them, which might amount to, to a crime. So I think for our students, they'd find this area of the course to be very, very interesting. And it really does, given the given our multi-faith, multi-cultural multi, uh, society and all the different range of issues that people bring to the legal system, I think it gives rise to an insightful and a compassionate part of the course where we can understand that not everyone who appears before the courts is you know, necessarily experiencing the same um, needs. The way we actually approach this part of the course when we're writing the chapter, and as Lisa said, I think one of the great strengths of, for me as a co-writer, is the, the extent of working with Lisa and Annie. We, we spend a lot of time discussing what we think might work in the book, and I think that's one of the great strengths of having other, other writers uh, to lean on. And uh, we did a lot of research, we looked at inquiries into the criminal justice system and what are the issues which tend to present before the courts or in dealing with the police, which really mirror the nature of contemporary society. And I think that's where this part of the course works really well. Notice with the key skill is there to actually discuss and which, as you know, means look at both sides. And we really can't expect the legal system to address all of the difficulties which someone brings to the court, uh, issues relating to poverty, lack, lack of education, um, an experience before they came to this country, let's say if they're from a war-torn uh, country, there's only so much that the legal system can do. However, we look at, well, what more could we be doing to try to meet the needs of, of these people? Just go on to the next slide. Yep, thank you. This is, um, this is just one example of looking at the culturally and ling linguistically diverse group in society. We need to look at what actually KELD actually means. And I think for some students, they might not be really familiar with that. And um, we need to look at just not uh, language difference, but a, a dialect difference within, within a language. And these things actually matter when someone comes before the courts. Trying to find an interpreter for someone who speaks a minority dialect might be really you know, challenging for the legal system. And how do we seek to deal with that? Um, it also disproportionately affects people in terms of family violence, whether they have a capacity to understand what the legal system is here and even being able to reach out for legal aid is a, a further issue which needs to be dealt with. Um, people are not really familiar with the legal system. Even a situation where a person has come to this uh, country from um, a situation where they may not be able to trust, trust the police, they might be living under a military regime, you know, these are very real difficulties as to as to what that person feels they can actually, um, um, you know, cope with when um, a situation arises where they should be able to go to the police, but their past experience of dealing with the police would tend to suggest that they really can't do that. Um, and that also is victims and accused persons. The measures to address, address the difficulties, we look at that in great detail. And this uh, final point, it really gives the students the chance to actually discuss, well, where is the criminal justice system and what can it actually do to deal with the difficulties and really what uh, we can do. I think the main point that I would make to students is to be informed about the difficulties and those of our students who go into work in areas like social work, psychology, the law, they'll be a lot more versant in the issues which come before them. 
So, yeah, I really enjoyed writing this topic. Um, and Annie, Lisa and I, you know, we really brainstormed the ideas for this um, uh, topic and I think it's come up uh, very, very well. I'll pass on to Annie, I think. Okay, thanks so much, Peter, and welcome again, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit about Unit 2, Area Study 3 on human rights. And whilst this area study is similar to the current area study, which is rights, it does include a number of changes. So just a couple of the changes. For example, um, the new study design no longer has the key knowledge dot points the influence of international declarations and treaties on the protection of rights in Australia also doesn't have the approach adopted by one other country in protecting rights. So they've been removed from the new study design and a new key knowledge has been added in, which in requires the students to examine the meaning and the development of human rights, including the significance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think perhaps the most significant other change is also instead of studying as a separate key knowledge area, one Australian case that has an impact on the protection of rights in Australia, the new study design requires students to study one human rights issue in Australia. And in relation to that human rights issue, they study a number of points. And those points include possible reforms to the protection of human rights, which we study in the current course as a standalone KK or key knowledge. And also within that um, human rights issue, they then study one case in relation to the issue in which an individual or a group has influenced the protection of that right. So they still do study the case, but it's within looking at the broader context of a human rights issue. So I'll just change the slide for you. So while teachers and students are able to choose which area of human rights they want to investigate, the study design provides three examples that you can investigate, and they're the ones that we've decided to focus on and examine in the textbook. So that is the right to vote, the right to freedom of religion and the rights of First Nations peoples. So it's just interesting there, while the text examines all three of those suggested areas, students can pick their own area and also just remember they're only required to study one. So that's just worthwhile keeping in mind. So the next slide here, um, when investigating selected, the hum, selected human rights issue, students are required to study a number of key knowledge stems or, or subpoints, and we've addressed that um, in a very systematic way in the textbook. We've addressed all of those um, key stems that they need to look at, and you can have a look on that slide, and it shows you those stems, the nature and development of the right, the laws that apply, possible reforms and conflicting attitudes and a case study. And you'll see from that slide that, in fact, because the relevant key skill here is for students to discuss possible reforms to the protection of rights in Australia, we've actually combined the two sub points, conflicting um, attributes and uh, conflicting attitudes, sorry, and possible reforms. We think that will allow a better, uh, facilitate a better discussion for the students. So, for example, in relation to the right to vote, uh, students examine possible conflicting attitudes and reforms related to lowering the voting age and allowing all prisoners uh, to vote in elections. And then we link that nicely through to the Roach case, which is a useful one to have for Unit 3 and 4 when we do the link to representative government. Okay, I'll just change there. So that's, again, addressed on that slide. And just finally, as you can see on slide 15, just worth, uh, as Lisa touched on, um, that both of the textbooks do include the, the well-structured summary tables that, you know, we all love to use um, that directly address the higher order key skills that we've got. So we've got tables, summary tables in there for discuss, evaluate and analyse. And for example, on this slide, we've got a table showing the points that the students might examine when they're discussing the possible reforms to the right to vote. And we've included a few restrictions and limitations in the discussion points. So that's, that's it for um, Area Study 3 in Unit 2.
Thanks. I'll hand it over to Lisa. Thanks. I was, just, I was just about to do the talking whilst my mute button was on, but managed to catch myself just at the last minute. Thanks, Annie. I thought I would briefly talk about the principles of justice and how we approach them in this area or in this um, in these new additions. Um, the principles of justice feature throughout units one and two, and more particularly in units three, area study one and area study two. The principles of justice at the moment in the current study design are defined in the study design. I think it's about page five or thereabouts, but they are, if you see them at the moment, and I'm sure those who have been teaching it for a few for a while will know that those definitions are a little bit circular and potentially a little bit confusing because there is sort of that sort of, I think they're so broad that there is sort of a difficulty in understanding, you know, where does sort of fairness start and end, where does equality start and end and so on and so forth. I think that really the community has done very well over the past few years to really sort of grapple with those with those principles of justice. But you will notice in the new study design at page six, there are changes in the definition. So much, much more clearer definitions about what fairness means, what equality means and what access means without using those words. So there are some sort of synonyms brought in, which we'll talk to in a second. More particularly, other than the definitions, you will notice throughout the study design, these sort of subheadings that are used throughout Unit 1, Area Study 3, Unit 2, Area Study 2, and Unit 3, Area Study 1 and 2. And really what that is doing is really connecting or scoping out what the principles of justice are relevant to. So they are, for example, this is an example in relation to Unit 3, Area Study 1, the principles of justice during a criminal case, and then there are a series of key, series of key knowledge sitting below it. In terms of how we've approached it in the textbook, really we've stuck very closely with the definitions. So, for example, fairness, this is the definition in the study design. All people can participate in the justice system and its processes should be impartial and open. To be honest, it was quite an enjoyable process to write about the principles of justice this time around because really that definition really provided that scaffold and what we've done then is basically separated to fairness out into these three features. It's about impartiality, it's about open justice, it's about participation and you'll see those subheadings throughout every time we tackle the principles of justice or the principle of fairness, we look at those three is there impartiality? Is there open justice? Is there participation? There's less to work with in terms of open justice. There's not a lot you can talk about, um, but there's a lot you can talk about in relation to impartiality and participation in particular. You know, that participation process of, you know, is there has there been full disclosure? Do they understand what's happening in the justice system? You know, um, do they have an interpreter available so they can actually actively participate? Does someone have legal representation where they can actively participate? So we've sort of kind of tried to really grapple with that. Um, the other thing that we picked up in, this, in the definition is that all people. So one thing to pick out is it's not limited, for example, to the plaintiff and the defendant, to um, the, um, the prosecutor and to the accused person. So really we sort of broaden it out, particularly in the criminal justice system, to victims. So does the victim have an opportunity to participate is there open justice or should there be open justice in, in particular in relation to more vulnerable witnesses? So we sort of really grappled with that all people as much as possible. Moving on to equality, um, again, a lot clearer and sort of quite enjoyable to grapple with because we saw this as sort of two really kind of features. It's about saying people should be treated in the same way. So there's a sameness. But if that sameness causes disparity or disadvantage, you need to treat people differently. So there need to be measures that are be implemented to allow people to engage to avoid that disparity or disadvantage. We've kept that, I love this picture, we've kept that picture in, but we've made it really clear to say that's formal equality, that's substantive equality, whereas I think it was a bit murky in the past of is it fairness or is it quality? But now we're going, that's formal equality, that same treatment, but look at that picture when you've got disparity here, what do you need to do to address that disparity? And there are lots of really good examples. You can't exhaust it. But for example, if you've got someone who can't speak English, doesn't understand, there's the disparity. So you can't, you can't limit yourself to same treatment. You've got to then go, what measures do I need to put in place to make sure that that disparity can be reduced or re um, to change? So, 
we've just brought in what the cases have said. You've got to have an interpreter. The High Court has said an interpreter is necessary. You've 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 got to have um, information in different languages. You might need to speak slowly. You might need to have breaks for people who are disabled, for people who have got mental health issues. You might need to have a different court system. So we tried to bring in as many possible measures as, as we can to sort of show that different treatment. Looking at, a, 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 and sorry, I should also say equality again, it was about all people. So I think, you know, for example, when you're looking at the VLRC and the recent juries one, for example, they're saying as well, you need to treat some people differently. So if you've got a jury member who's hard of hearing, maybe you need to allow the law to bring an interpreter into the jury room to sign an oath so that they can actually participate and then engage in the system. So finally, with access, again, we sort of adopted this two-pronged approach. So we talked about engagement and then informed basis. So engagement's about using the system. So you should be able to access the courtroom. You should be able to physically go and attend. You should be able to um, know your rights. You should be able to be, um, you know, access an online virtual hearing. But that alone might not be enough for access. It's got to be on an informed basis. So just because someone can physically access the court building, are they informed enough to be able to then actually make use of the system? So maybe to be informed, they need to have VLA to assist them to then actually engage with it. So we've sort of, again, adopted the two things. And again, that all people, that idea that everyone should be able to engage with the justice system, victims, for example. We've kept the strengths and weaknesses where they're relevant to the principles of justice and we were, we thought a lot about this as to whether or not we should link each of the strengths and weaknesses to the principles of justice and we made the decision not to. The reason being is that when we looked at the um, definitions of the principles of justice, there real, still is that overlap and so we sort of really think it's really sort of on the students really to sort of say, well, now that you know what the principles mean and now what you know what the strengths and weaknesses are, connect them based on what you know. And so in each of the Check Your Learning in Unit 3, for example, we've got this example that we've provided and said now over to you, um, try and do it. So, for example, you know, VLA being able to provide information in other languages and organise a free interpreter allows for a participation, which is fairness, ensures people are not disadvantaged because they don't speak English, so equality, and allows them to be engage, to engage in the criminal justice system, so access. So that's sort of how we've, we've approached the strengths and weaknesses. Okay, I'll pass over to, I think it is Annie. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. Thanks for that one on the right side. Um, Look, I'm going to now just briefly address the law reform section in Unit 4, Area of Study 2, uh, one that we have to look at inquiries. So an interesting one just to run through what we've chosen as our different inquiries to look at. So in the new study design, Unit 4, Area of Study 2 is divided into two subheadings. So it's law reform and a very new part, constitutional reform. So with regard to the law reform, the main changes are actually just relating to ex instead of examining recommendations for law reform, the new study design requires us to examine law reform inquiries. So as you can see on this slide, for example, in relation to the Victorian Law Reform Commission, students under the new study design are required to look at one recent inquiry relating to the um, law reform of the criminal and civil justice system. So currently we look at the VLRC recommending law reform. So it's, it's more broad now they're going to look at a, a recent inquiry. And similarly, in relation to all commissions and parliamentary committees, students in the new study design are required to look at one recent Royal Commission inquiry or, not and, or one recent parliamentary committee inquiry. And so, again, we know currently that they look at one recent example of a recommendation for law reform. So I'll just swap over the slide for us there. So just running through the inquiries that we've looked at, we've tried to do a really good cross-section here. And remember, students only need to look at one, So, it's a, but we've provided two for Royal Commissions, Parliamentary Committees and VLRC. So they only need to look at one. So with relation to the 
um, VLRC, we've had a look at Victoria's laws on stalking, harassment and similar conduct, the inquiry into that. And we've also looked at the Community Law Reform Project or the inquiry into making sure that juries are more inclusive and accessible for people who are deaf, hard of hearing, blind or have low vision. And these have been recently completed, either in 2022 or 23, just released, as you can see on the slide. So that's going to keep it nice and current right through to 2026 and 27, respectively. So just having a look at the Royal Commissions, for Royal Commissions and Parliamentary Committees, we decided to look at one state example and one federal example. So the Royal Commissions for Victoria, we're having a look at the Yuruk Justice Commission, which was established officially to hear and record and address the truths about historical and un ongoing injustices experienced by First Nations people in Victoria since colonisation to the present time. So at the moment, we know that that Royal Commission has introduced its interim report and the final report is actually due in 2025. So that will keep it current um, or recent within the definition of four years until 2029. And, of course, in relation to anything that's ongoing like that, uh, OUP, we will provide on the in the O-Book and on the website updates when the final reports and cases, et cetera, are released. So that'll be something to watch out for in 2025 and beyond. Uh, for the Federal Royal Commission, we look at the robo Debt Royal Commission, which has just been released, as we know, and current right through to 2027. Next slide, just quickly on the Parliamentary Committees. For the Victorian one, we have a look at the Legislative Assembly's Legal and Social Issues Committee inquiry into the anti-vilification laws. And at a federal level, we have a look at the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs inquiry into the online gambling and its impact on those experience, get, experiencing gambling harm. And that one, again, has just been released over the last couple of weeks. Look, finally, just as a note, I wanted to mention before I go that for the purposes of the current study design that we're all teaching now, we know that VCARS put out uh, or addressed the definition of recent in the frequently asked questions. So we know that currently uh, recently is defined as being within the last four years and specifically in relation to recommendations for reform in Unit 4, which is now going to be looking at recent inquiries, the recommendations can originate can have originated more than four years previous to the current year, provided there's been a type of change or a legal discussion or perhaps a new aspect of the recommendation that's occurred within the last four years. Importantly, if you're thinking about that for this year, students must cite that um, recent change or the new aspect in their recommendation. So we don't have the facts for the new course, the frequently asked questions, but it'd be definitely worth just keeping an eye out, um, you know, over the next few months for any further information that VCAR might distribute regarding the definition of recent for, for the new study design. Thanks so much. Okay, this is uh, a new part of the course, Unit 4, Area of Study 2. Writing this chapter was quite interesting because as legal studies teachers, we're used to completed reports or finalised processes. And as Annie and Lisa know, um, <laughs> we're sort of almost running, running, to, running to keep pace with something that we won't know the outcome until maybe as late as December. As um, And notice if you look at the... Um, look at the key knowledge, it's the possible constitutional reforms, including reforms to establish a First Nation, Nations voice. Now, that is obviously um, a significant, one of the most significant debates of the last 50 years, really, as to what's going to happen with referendum this year. Um, by the time the book goes to print, and if, if you actually look at it, like the bill went through Parliament in June, so it would be any time from August to December that the referendum is actually held. With that being said, what um, what Oxford will do will produce some digital resources based on the outcome, which we don't know what that will be, and we really just have to wait in terms of the state of play. We need to wait until we're aware of what 
there might be any uh, changes to the key knowledge and key skills. None of that, none of, none of that can be known until the outcome is actually known. But that being said, um, whatever the outcome, it would be um, it'd be a fruitful study looking at the um, the referendum process, whether it succeeds or um, doesn't succeed. There'll be really fertile ground to to look at that next year. Um, our bit. The fact that we don't know what the outcome will be and we don't know how VCAR might um, shift the key knowledge and key, key skills, um, we just have to wait on that and produce the digital resources when they come through. I just want to assure you all that we're absolutely across this and we are committed 100% to producing outstanding digital resources after the referendum, whatever shape that will be, and linking it into the new course. So. Um, you will know that there'll be very, very strong sort of, you know, stuff there. How we actually approach this, uh, we've we've really covered the Uluru Statement from the heart. We've covered the proposed changes. We've looked at the reasons for the referendum, um, reasons to actually support it. Um, the other, the other um, uh, possible reform is also the move to become a republic. Now, when the Albanese government was voted into power in May last year, one of their um, one of their promises was to have a republic referendum after the term of this parliament. So it would be any time after 2025. For those of us who have been teaching since 1999, um, that was an absolutely spectacular fail. Zero, zero out of six states. Um, I think the most Republican state was ours, 49% in Victoria. Um, in, in the textbook, in this topic, we we sort of had a lot to work on because we looked back at 1999 and, you know, looked at the failure and what, what was the reason for that. And the main reason was there were two, two conflicting models about how we actually choose the president. Um, and the fact that the Queen was still with us at that time and the fondness for her um, was a factor in people not wanting to dispose of the monarchy. The fact that the Queen has now passed on... Um, there's other factors which might suggest that going back to the well again in, say, 2025, um, it might actually pass. So um, uh, with what we've done for this topic, the First Nations Voice has very detailed uh, coverage of, you know, what of the process to date, but that's a work in uh, progress depending on the outcome of the referendum. With the, with the Republic referendum, um, given that the government has said that they will put it to the people 2025, maybe 2026, the material that's in the book will be very worthwhile for students. And um, the other the other good thing about having a, re a referendum now and at you know at the end of this year, there's only one in, there's only one well the last one was 24 years ago. Our year 12 students, our unit three four students next year would have followed the referendum. And certainly if you teach unit one two this year, Really make sure your students are across that, certainly for um, Unit 2.3, looking at their rights. Um, so when they land in Year 12 next year or those doing Unit 3 and 4, they'll be familiar with the First Nations Voice of the Parliament uh, referendum. So whatever work we can do this year in the rights component of, of the course would be really useful for next year. Um, so I'll hand back to Anne and Emily, I think. Yep. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you. Um, I also would like to just acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri land today and also acknowledge that these lands were never ceded and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So in terms of um, general classroom considerations, um, this is more very holistic and broad. I won't go into each individual one, but I think I would start broad with just saying that um, you want to know the basics first. So know which land you're teaching on, whose country you're on. Um, make sure that your students are educated in that just to promote the respect and knowledge of First Nations history. Uh, try and avoid approaching these teachings of First Nations content from a deficit approach. Whilst there has been a lot of trauma and disadvantage that's been faced to First Nations people, um, it's really important to acknowledge the strength and resilience that has come through from histories, uh, a history of um, really dis a big disadvantage. Um, it's the longest continuing culture in the world and make sure that that is well known to students when you're teaching this history, even when covering these traumatic topics. 
Uh, also avoiding mass generalizations is important. Uh, it's really important to acknowledge that this is not a monolithic culture. It is very different for different people, different states, different families, different mobs. There is different opinions as well. So acknowledging that whilst also being able to explain some commonly held feelings or beliefs is still important. Um, and that will be a running theme through all First Nations content that's being taught in these units. Um, it's also important, and I'll touch on this a little bit more, but to recognise First Nations people and the role they played in their own history. So throughout all of these units, you will see a lot in terms of judicial activism, for instance, in the Mabo case, but recognising the years that it took to get there and that that was through First Nations people fighting to get it there before a judge, that's really important to recognise as well in that contribution before it even got to that stage. Um, also important to recognise um, when you need to give trigger warnings. So I would just approach this from the basis of assuming that you have First Nations students in your classroom. You may not always know. Um, and it's really important if you are about to cover content for, uh, for instance, photos that have deceased people in them or that are going to be talking about deceased people, to flag that as a trigger warning as well. Um, moving on to units one and two, this doesn't cover everything in terms of First Nations content, but some big topics that are covered in here that I think is important to mention um, is the establishment of the legal system that is detailed from 1901. Um, I would be really um, hesitant to say that it was the first one, um, and I would really encourage you to take care and be sensitive when describing this formation. Um, it was definitely not the first system in place, um, nor is it the only system in place. There are still a lot of cultures and traditions that are that have survived, um, and it's really important to say that this is not the first and only legal system that was implemented in Australia. There is also going to be difficulties that um, have been outlined already a little bit by Peter that First Nations people have commonly felt or continue to feel. Again, this is not going to be a universal experience and making sure that you outline that very clearly, but that it can be a common um, theme or thread for First Nations people. Um, some of those big difficulties that will be touched upon um, is the fact that this system was historically not inclusive for First Nations people and in a lot of ways is still not. And it was not built with First Nations people in mind. So being cognizant of that and what that flow on impact has to this day is really important. And that has led to an ongoing distrust in the system. Uh, intergenerational trauma is also touched upon as another difficulty. And in this, there, there may be, again, common threads or common feelings that a lot of people face um, when they are struggling with intergenerational trauma. But this is probably the biggest one that I would emphasise, not overgeneralising um, or oversimplifying. This is a very complex issue and it is very different based on each individual and family. And it's felt in a lot of ways differently. So I would just acknowledge that from the outset, that this is a complex area and unless that has been lived by you specifically, there's just no way to really understand or know personally what that's like. So I think approaching that right from the outset is the best way to go when talking about this topic. Um, moving on to units three and four, um, a couple of big areas that will pop up is judicial activism. So again, I briefly touched on this in that it's really important to acknowledge the First Nations peoples that fought to get it to the point where there, there was a decision, sorry, where there was a decision being made. Um, acknowledging all of the hard work and the agitation that First Nations people put in, um, including in the people's movement for the 1967 referendum, which is also touched upon. Um, this was after years of First Nations people advocating for themselves for recognition. And with the help of allies joining on board, this was able to get over the line. But it's just, again, really important that it's very clear that First Nations people were the first that were leading this charge and then getting allies on board as well. Um, and that does lead into the, the voice as well. So the new referendum, again, a long fought battle for First Nations people and a demand basically to get some recognition in the constitution to have a say in areas that affect First Nations people, along with also the treaty process. But I don't think the, the units necessarily touch on that. But again, part of First Nations activism, along with allies that are helping, but definitely First Nations leading the charge in that area. So I would just say in general, 
with teaching this First Nations content, it's really important to be sensitive, not overgeneralize or oversimplify some of these issues um, and just be cognizant of the people that might be in the room that you're teaching as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Emily. I think that was a really um, thought provoking and insightful presentation. So thank you for that. So now I'd like to introduce you to our new editions of Legal Studies for VCE. So this edition has been purpose written for the new study design and it maintains the high quality and accurate standards that you're used to in the Oxford text, as well as introducing some new features which we'll look at in a minute. You can choose from different products depending on the needs of your school. We have a blended product um, that includes both the print student book and the student iBook Pro, which is the digital version plus supporting resources. We have a digital only student iBook Pro product and a teacher iBook Pro, which is also digital only. So let's have a look at the key features of the student book. Each book has a standalone toolkit chapter, which has got an overview of the course structure, lots of tips for good study habits and success in assessment tasks, uh, sections on command words and legal citation, careers in the law and more. Each chapter begins with um, an engaging opening picture linked to the topic. And this spread shows the outcome, key knowledge and key skills from the study design for the chapter, as well as the list of key legal terms. And it also has links to an interactive warm-up quiz and a Quizlet set of key legal terms for the chapter. We take a clear topic-based approach that aligns topics directly to key knowledge points. The key knowledge point is shown at the start of the topic and we'll have high quality bite-sized videos that outline the key knowledge points. And these can be used as an introduction or as a recap. And these little blue icons here um, are a new feature of this edition. And they indicate that a resource can be opened directly by clicking on the icon in the Student Book Pro. And in that case, that icon will open to a video. Uh, we've got our targeted study tips that help students achieve better results. We have actual scenarios that provide key legal cases and media articles to help demonstrate the law in action. Oops, sorry. Uh, summary tables help students refine their skills. So for example, the key skill here requires students to discuss costs and time as the factor that can affect the ability of courts to make law. So this table helps them identify those points. Each topic ends with a panel of check your learning questions in which the command words are bolded and the questions are also leveled to allow for differentiation. And the check your learning questions can be completed online by clicking one of those blue icons. And each topic has a short interactive quiz, which can also be accessed by clicking on one of the icons. So as well as the actual scenarios I mentioned earlier, we also have hypothetical scenarios to stimulate discussion about how laws work in different contexts. And we have, did you know, snippets sprinkled through, um, providing some quirky high interest facts about the law. And we also have our key legal terms defined on the page so students can access them at the point of learning. They are also um, combined in a glossary at the back of the book. Each chapter ends with a chapter review, which includes top exam or assessment tips from the chapter and a chapter checklist for students to reflect on their understanding of the key knowledge for this chapter. Oh, sorry, I've just lost. I just tipped out there. Uh, yeah, and then each unit ends with a unit review that guides students as to how to answer the assessment questions, including tips to maximise results. And each tip then gives some practical support, demonstrating the tip in action and providing a sample response. And we then have a section called Think Like an Assessor, where students mark a sample response to an exam question using a marking guide, and then they have an opportunity to fix the response. And then each unit ends with a practice assessment task for each area of study in the unit. So we've got lots of new features, but we're also uh, retaining, you know, all our, all our tried and, and true resources like uh, PowerPoint summaries and revision notes. So let's have a look at the digital platform. So if you're using our current edition, um, this has been upgraded substantially since then. So you will notice some changes. Some of the new features include that suite of new key knowledge videos that I mentioned a minute ago, enhanced functionality for assigning and monitoring work and expanded reporting functionality. 
And we also have a new partnership with ClickView, which means we can provide links to ClickView videos and update them throughout the life of the edition. So now I'm going to walk you through the digital features of the new edition. We decided to record this walkthrough with the video rather than doing battle with a live demonstration um, and the internet. And we've created a sample of digital resources while we complete work on the final products. So you will be able to access this through those logins I mentioned earlier. But just do note that some of the new features are still being developed and aren't included in the sample just yet. And the student book content on, in the sample is still in production, so it's not completely finalised yet. So let's now go to the video. Okay, just take a second to switch here. So this is the login page for Oxford Digital. So to log in, I'll click the sign in button in the top corner. And I'm going to enter the login details for the Legal Studies sample account. I'll log in first as a teacher and then later as a student to show you how things work on the student side. So this is the library page. You can see here the units three and four book. Uh, your digital login will provide units one and two as well. And that, sample, and that teacher guide to the study design that I mentioned earlier. So from this library page, uh, I can download my titles for offline access using that little pink OBook offline. There are some instructions there on the sample and this replace, replaces the PDF downloads. But let's first of all, jump in and take a look at the units three and four sample. So this is the welcome page for units three and four. And at the bottom here is the notification section and anything new you've assigned to students will show here as well as any marking that you might need to do. The tabs up the top help get you where you want to go more quickly. So we are on the home screen, but by clicking on resources, you can view and assign any resource from the book. From assigned work, you can access and monitor all the work you've assigned across any of your classes and check who's completed the work. And then reports provides an electronic mark book. So we will look at all of those later, but let's start by jumping into the student book because you can also view and assign resources and check results from within the e-reader. So I click on read and launch the product. So the interactive menu down the left opens by default and you can expand each chapter to show each topic. And you can close that menu to maximize the reading view. So down the bottom, there are a few e-reader tools. The book content button opens the menu back up whenever you need it. Then the resources button lets you see all the resources for the topic and chapter. So lessons plan, quizzes, web links, student book answers, and so on. The notes button lets you highlight sections of the text and make notes on it. And so you can see here that I've made a note to highlight a particular section and I've added a note, which appears here. And I can share that note with a single student or a small group or the whole class using this share button here. We've got bookmarking functionality and you can tag particular pages in the book, but the e-reader does automatically remember where you are at the end of a session and opens up at that page next time you log in. Every o-book comes with the Oxford Concise Australian Dictionary built in for free. So I can type into the search bar directly like this and the definition appears above. Or I can just select a word or a whole sentence in the text and click the icon there and the definition again appears at left. So we'll just close that. And here we are at the start of topic 3.5 and we can click through the topic using these arrows at the bottom. And these little blue circles that we've been talking about will open just by clicking on them. So that opens a quiz, or I can open any resource from that panel as well. So as a teacher, I want to assign some homework. So I'm going to assign the quiz me and the check your learning activities from the resources panel. So I click these boxes here and then click assign. 
and I'm taken to a calendar where I can choose when I want the resource to be assigned and when it needs to be done by. So I'll assign it for the 20th with a due date of the 24th. And so I click apply and then I need to select my class. I'm going to assign it to everyone, but I can send it to one person or to a smaller group as well. Apply, and the system generates a name for that assignment, but I can change that if I want. And each student gets a notification in their O-book about this assignment, but I can also email them and send them a notice, an extra reminder, so I will do that now. And now that's been assigned. So I'm going to log out as a teacher now and log in as a student so you can see what happens on the student side. So I'll click on the student book and down the bottom in the notifications panel, I can see that my teachers uh, assigned me a couple of activities to do and I can see that they're due on Monday. So I can click on the tile directly from that panel and I will start with Check Your Learning. So we're going to just speed through these. Obviously, these answers are pretty ordinary quality, so don't take any notice of that. It's just a demonstration. Um, some of the questions can, are auto-marked, but these ones will need to be marked by a teacher, and we'll see how that works in a minute. So you'll see here that I'm being told my activity has been submitted and is with the teacher for marking. So while that's happening, I'm going to jump back to the notifications and you can see that check your learning has been marked as completed and I'm going to do the quiz me. So again, we'll speed through a couple of these questions, but these ones are all auto marked. So students will get an instant result. So once I've submitted that, I will get a results screen and under my recent result, I can see how I performed on this graph. And then I can click review results to see how I perform question by question. If I scroll down and the correct answers are given. So now I will log out as a student and back in as a teacher and we'll do some marking. So again, going down to the notification section, you'll see I'm being told I've got some marking to do. So I'm going to click on this icon and award some marks. And so jumping ahead here a bit, you can see that I've uh, left some comments and for the student and awarded some marks. I can save my work as I go in case I get interrupted in the middle of marking. So now I've completed my marking. I'm going to check in to see how everyone's going. So I'm going to go to the reports tab. So there's two kinds of reports offered for every student, an assessment report and a curriculum report. So the assessment report shows me how everyone is performing in terms of engagement and marks. And I can drill down to the individual question level for every student to see how they went. So again, that's a similar, a similar screen to what you just saw as a student. And then the system highlights performance of students using colour coding at above, beyond or below level. And you can turn, you can turn, that, or turn that coding off or filter it um, as you want to. And then the curriculum report helps me track student performance against every key knowledge in the study design. So each interactive question in the text is tagged against a key knowledge point from the study design. So if I click on the unit title here and then the chapter, I can see 
the key knowledge points across the top and I can see how each student's performing against that key knowledge. So the last thing I want to show you are these couple of tabs up the top. Under the resources tab, you can find all the teacher and student resources for the whole book in one place and you can apply filters to find specific resources. And then under the assigned work tab, you'll see a summary of what work you've assigned, when it's due and which students have completed it. And then you can also delete, it, delete that when you're finished with it. So that is a whistle stop tour of our new additions. Um, if you'd like to see more, uh, could we just switch back to the slides, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to see more, you can contact one of our sales consultants and we will uh, give you their details in a moment. So now I'm going to hand over to one of those excellent consultants, Paul McCallum, who will take you through the product configurations and availability. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Anne. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. Uh, so the pricing uh, configurations and availability, um, we can see the Student Book and the O-Book Pro um, is $84.95. The availability of these books, uh, we've got Units 1 and 2 in November, Units 3 and 4 in October. Um, with the conditions there, the digital access is included for two years in each of those books. Um, and there is a reactivation code that will be needed to be purchased for any secondhand books, but that won't need to apply for a couple or a year or so once you purchase these books. Uh, just the student book, uh, student notebook pro, the digital only is $64.95. This will be available um, prior to the 2024 uh, school year. Um, that is a price per student per year. Um, and then there's the teacher book, uh, OBook Pro, and that is $299.95. Again, that'll be available in January next year uh, prior to school starting. Um, but keep it in mind that it is free uh, for those schools that are adopting and putting legal studies, um, new additions on their book list. Um, and that's a continuous license as well. Um, if you add that along with gratis copies that we'll provide also, then you're getting very good value to put the product on your book list also. Um, as Anne mentioned, uh, there are three uh, of uh, education consultants throughout Victoria. Um, I'm one of those. That's me there. Um, my colleagues, Alicia and Caitlin, uh, are also available. Um, we do look after different regions of the state, um, but feel free to contact any of us. Um, you've probably been contacted by one of us at some stage anyway, and if that's the case, we're probably your consultant as well. But if you have any further questions, um, We'll be in contact with you anyway, but if there's something that you need to speak to us about, please don't hesitate to uh, give us a, an email or, or, or a call um, on those details there. So thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. So that's the end of our session. Um, we now are going to look at any questions that haven't been answered yet. So I'll just go through to the chat. Uh, we had a question about the implementation of the study design, which Lisa has answered implementations 2024 for all units um, this one's been answered but it might be a good one to just look at as well um, would recent yeah how do we define recent um, cases Annie would you like to take that one Thanks, Anne. Um, yes, look, that, that's been something that's been addressed each year since 2018 when we, they brought in the current study design. And Megan Jeffries has answered that in a couple of um, online forums and, and various means over the years. And so basically at the moment um, it means that the four years is calculated from the beginning of the current academic year. So we would assume this would mean next year in 2024 would include inquiries and cases from the beginning of 2020. So you'd have 2020, 2021, 2022 and 2023. However, we that is based on this year. So just a, a really big um, reminder always just really important to keep a, a look out for up-to-date current advice from VCAR and abide by any specific information we might get on frequently asked questions and that sort of thing over the coming months. 
Thanks, Annie. And um, someone has asked if the text will be available for early commencement um, in mid-November. Yes, it will. Units three and four of the print book is due in October and units one and two in November. Uh, do the questions in the check you're learning have marks allocated to them? Lisa, did you want to? I know you've answered that. I'm just not sure if, if people have seen the answers. Yeah, oh, no, sorry. No, the, yeah. yeah, it's a good question. So in the check your learning, the marks are not allocated and really we see the check your learning as an opportunity for students to sort of recall, remember, you know, sort of start to build their skills around application, evaluation and discussion. But then at the end of the chapter where you've got sort of a low, medium and high example of a question and the practice assessment tasks, there are marks allocated to them. So then that starts to really then see where they are sitting. Um, so I think we sort of make a distinction between the check your learning is not sort of setting sort of marks or anything, but really developing the skills. Just on questions too, I just wanted to point out that the check your learning questions, um, which students can now do interactively if they want. I mean, if you want them to write, they can still just do, do them in their books. But the uh, the interactive version, um, there will be sample answers added to those for teachers to use for marking. Uh, ISBN details. Must be now completing book lists now through Box of Books. Paul, are you? did you want to answer that one? I mean, we do have the ISBNs, so... Sorry, and um, if... Anyone wants ISBNs or any further information, please just uh, contact your consultant and we'll be able to uh, help arrange that for you. Yep. And can teachers access the student version of the text? Yes, teachers have um, access to everything that the student has access to, as well as, you know, stuff that's just for teachers. Um, do we provide any access to practice exams? We, we do. So at the, at the moment, um, we provide a practice SAC test, in addition to, I always use the ones at the end of every chapter, the practice assessment tasks, I love those. They have, they'll have comprehensive answers, um, more so than the check you're learning, they're really comprehensive answers. And also we provide sample uh, SAC tests for each one and there's a unit three and a unit um, three and four exam. Thank you. Um, is it possible to look at sample pages? Um, yes, the digital, the logins that you are going to get after this webinar, um, you've got access to pretty much full sample, sample pages for both books. When assigning check your learning tasks, is it possible to assign particular questions? Uh, I don't think so. I will have to do that and I'll get back to you, Caitlin. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer for that now. Any other questions? Uh, hang on, there was just one that disappeared. I think there's another one of any chance we could get a page at the front of the book, like the summary of legal scenarios that lists different sections of the Constitution or what pages they are talked about. Um, we probably can't get those in the printed books now, but we can certainly look at providing that perhaps as a digital resource if that would be helpful. Would it be in the index? I mean, it, it would, but I guess you've got to know what to look for. I yeah. Think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Just leave that with us and we'll see what we can do, Alistair. Thanks for that. Any other questions? It looks like we're all done. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. I know you would have had a very long and busy day, so I really appreciate the time and the fact that we've also run over a bit of time, so thanks for your patience. I'd also like to thank um, everyone who presented today. I think it was a really great session and I hope you all found it useful. So thanks very much and get in touch if there are any questions.